Thank you for joining us here at the SAB. We're going to be doing a webinar on novel approaches to lung nodule management. With me, uh, we've got Dr. Kyle Hogarth, University of Chicago Professor of Medicine and Advanced Bronchoscopist and past president of the SAB. Kyle, thanks for coming Great. along. My name is Chris. Yeah, you bet, Chris. Thanks for having and, me, man. Absolutely. Um, and my name is Chris Bodra. I'm an interventional pulmonologist in Chattanooga, Tennessee. All right, let's get cracking. All right, so our learning objectives today are we're going to be reviewing the current lung, uh, current lung cancer diagnostic guidelines, lung nodule diagnostic management. We're going to review the Percepta GSC performance and how it fits into lung cancer diagnosis protocols, review a real-world uh, example, and Percepta GSC sample collection and test ordering and highlight reward cases. So I'll start and I'll kick it off to you, uh, Dr. Hogarth. Go for it. Yeah. No, this is actually one of the first cases that we had, and I'll, I'll give you some backstory behind just this slide. So we had a 60-year-old male, as you can see here, he's a current smoker with 70 pack years. Stage two COPD, and then the nine millimeter nodule in the right upper lobe that you see there. And this was an incidental finding. Um, so let's start first. What's the risk of malignancy here? And let's, you know, I, everyone in, who's listening, I want you to sort of mentally calculate in your brain whether you'd say this is low, intermediate, or high risk. And then I'd like you to actually try to put a percentage risk to that. Um, so, Chris, let's go ahead and, and go to the poll. All right. Um, we have the poll streaming in right now. You know, uh, not let's. Um, yeah. What do you? Well, actually, while the poll's coming in, Chris, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. So when I look at this, and I'm and I'm looking at the nodule, you know, it has a spherical shape. Maybe there's, if I stare at it long enough, if you you know, if you do that, you can probably see in the northern aspect of it or the top aspect of it, and maybe a little speculation. 60 right. years old, just like our regular patient population, 70 pack years, has a history of COPD. Um, and the patient has this nine millimeter lung nodule. Now that's on the smaller size. You know, we tend to think that smaller lung nodules are have less risk for malignancy. And that's of course, absolutely true. Um, one thing that we need to, you know, I would probably say that this gentleman has a high risk of malignancy, um, just based on what I'm thinking of. But that nine millimeter may may sway it a little bit, so I'm not a hundred percent. So yeah, the group the group seemed to put him into uh, intermediate and high risk. So not too many voting on the low risk. So let's go. Yep. Okay. So I think this is where the interesting thing comes in. Wow. Um, yeah. So notice that the male calculator, uh, you know, to the limits of the male calculator. Um, found at 14.65% is, I'm sorry, 14.65% risk of malignancy, which is in the intermediate category. I think, you know, uh, Chris, you and I, and, and with several others have had a general conversation, you know, at meetings or just over the phone about, I think how we classify nodules, not necessarily as low, intermediate or high, the way we should, you know, as a profession in, in the sense of, of using our calculators and our clinical experience, but that we view each nodule as a, um, I think indirectly as part of that assessment, what's the risk of a biopsy? What's the success rate of a biopsy? What are the complications of that biopsy and the methods we're going to use? I think that indirectly weighs into some of the discussions. I don't know what your thoughts are on that one. Because, I mean, you see this nodule here. This is, this is you know, this, this, is, this case is from about 2015. So some of the, um, it's off airway. So it's going to be a challenging uh, biopsy from a bronchoscope perspective. And a transthoracic needle aspirate, that's, it's small and it's pretty central. Yeah, I think when I th look at this case, I tend to think about, um, you know, if you're asking me what I would do, I mean, here's four options that were presented. Um, a bronchial yeah, EBIT. While, and while you talk, you guys go ahead and start voting online. Yeah, go ahead and start doing that. Yeah, a CT scan with surveillance, uh, a transthoracic needle biopsy and thoracic surgery. Let me just walk you through what my impressions are. Um, when I think about bronchoscopy with EBIS, just like you said, I think it's very difficult, you know, in terms that there's not an airway, it's on the smaller size, um, and it depends. I think you had mentioned to me before that this was back in 2015, so we didn't even have advanced bronchoscopy tools that were available, the new platforms that are available now. 
Um, so that would make it even more challenging. And then you talk about uh, CT scan surveillance for three months. Yeah, that sounds really reasonable um, given its location. But And this is really interesting, though, when you talk about transthoracic needle aspirate, it's really, to me, it's institution dependent. Um, but if I'm an interventional radiologist, I'm looking at this, this is really central. And so you know that the, uh, the bronchovascular uh, bundles are right there. Um, it'd be fairly challenging. And thoracic surgery is awfully central for them to get, you know, the first at bat. So I'd probably shy away from that. Um, let's see how, uh, how everybody uh, fared here. Yeah, no, so I mean, well, I'll tell you how I did, and then I'll give you the backstory to this. But, but you know, and I, and I had a discussion you know, the guidelines talk about shared decision making. And I think, you know, there's a lot of things that factor into it. And, and, and you know, where this discussion is going to go and the, and the role for the Percepta tool really does center around the role it plays in, in decision making. Um, you know, but we didn't have it, um, you know, in my first discussion. But I actually explained to the patient that I did have this tool. So let me let me explain. So this guy was, was very worried about malignancy, um, but he definitely wanted to avoid thoracic surgery at all costs. Um, he had had a friend who had a needle biopsy, um, and it was a not pleasant experience. And you know, realistically, I I quoted this guy about a 20% pneumothorax rate for its location, and probably about a 10% chance of that they would miss given just its size. And, and my guys are excellent, so um, it wasn't that. I I told him I said, look, I'll bronch you, but but here's the thing, um, I'm going to very likely miss the nodule. So I upfront told him that my bronch was very likely to be non-diagnostic. But that I would at a minimum I'd be able to sample all his lymph nodes at least. And um, when those you know came back negative, if it needed to be resected, we'd at least know it was early stage. Um, but I also said I have this other test. So Percepta was was new and, and we were gonna be able to use it. I said, we're gonna go in and and I'll again I'll likely miss the nodule, but I'm gonna come back with some essentially what I said to the patient, just some some genetic information that's gonna tell me whether I need to be, you know more worried, less worried, or the same amount of worried, and we can make better decisions on your bronch. So sure enough, I missed. Um, I did sample all his notes. They were normal, so that was that was encouraging. Um, we'll come back to this, but you know, if it came back low risk now, then I could confidently say to this guy, because you know, we we sat down and did the calculator together, and the almost 15% chance of cancer really scared the crap out of him to be blunt. Um, but when I came back and said, you know, it's low risk based off of your perceptor, we changed the discussion. And of course, if it came back intermediate still or high, he would have pursued a more invasive test and honestly probably would have pursued lobectomy given the patient's um, concern for malignancy and, and knowing all his lymph nodes were negative. So let's yeah, move and I, on. And it's know. not. Yeah, I think when I when I hear that, I think, boy, a lot of people say, well, bronchoscopy really didn't help you that much, but I think it does. I think you, you find out you stage the mediastinum, you know exactly what's going on there, and then you find out about this uh, perceptor result. I think you it's a win for the patient because you can gain a lot more information, even though you know, and it's difficult to deal with a non-diagnostic bronchoscopy in terms of the peripheral lung nodule, but you did garner a lot of information. Well, and I think, you know, you and I've talked about this that in the past that the, you know, the, the biggest, you know, complication of bronchoscopy is non-diagnostic and, you know, we all hate it and, you know, you, you feel it's a complete failure. Um, so to have a, to test that, uh, that can actually salvage the non-diagnostic bronch is, is huge. And like I said, up front, I, I actually sort of, if you will, pitched it to the patient that, um, you know, we were going to stage the mediastinum and, um, since I was going to likely miss, I'd at least be able to do the perceptor to get some value out of the bronc for him. Um, and that was actually sort of the, the deal closer for the guy. Um, and so that's what allowed us to pr pursue forward. So this slide, as we talk about it, in the sense that, you know, risk calculators or just sort of our general clinical perception, both are, you know, pretty good. Um, obviously, size and age are some of the biggest uh, parts of the nodule calculator, and then obviously smoking status. One of the things about this slide is that we're going to be really focusing on this intermediate uh, risk classification, and that's where you have features of both the low and the high, and this is where the perceptive test really applies. Right, and the truth is, bulk of what you and I bronc should be in the intermediate category. I mean, there's very few low, I mean, there's always going to be exceptions, but, you know, when you look at a general uh, guidelines, I mean, look look right here at the at the chest guidelines, I mean, the new solid indeterminate nodule is eight to 30 millimeters. Because the truth is, though um, many people have you know, reported on successful biopsies of smaller lesions, there are very few clinical scenarios that you need to biopsy a six millimeter nodule. 
right? I mean, it just, and when you start to get above 30 millimeters, unless there are clear benign characteristics, um, it's really hard to classify something as a low risk nodule when it's greater than 30 millimeters in size. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think this, this guideline is, you know, very useful in the sense that when you have a low to moderate risk nodule, which is, um, uh, I'm sorry, a, a new indeterminate nodule, and they have the ability to, uh, you know, to have a low or moderate risk surgery, let's go through and uh, assess what the probability of cancer is. And a lot of them come back in that low to moderate category. The guidelines do recommend a PET. It's something that is not often done in, in, at my institution for nodule workup, and that a lot of that's insurance driven. Um, but this, this sweet spot of the non-surgical biopsy, I think, you know, this is important when you actually look at the data, and that's that big bold box to the right there, that 80% of pulmonary nodules referred to pulmonologists are in the intermediate risk group. So, you know, I've met people who said, oh, everything I see is high risk. You know, I, I, my first answer is, no, that's not even remotely possible. And number two, then why are they seeing you? Because if we follow the guidelines, pure high risk ought to be going straight to surgery, though, we, as we know, there's clearly data that says we should be staging these folks as well. So, um, the, the, the point here is that if you are a bronchoscopist at all, bulk of what you're seeing by definition is going to be this intermediate risk group. And this is the challenge. Because as we all know, bulk of what you see on CT nodule wise, all, you know, all nodules are gonna be benign. And I think this is the, the next, you know, the middle slide there is, or the middle stat is the one that always bothers me. 30% of surgical lung biopsies are still performed on benign nodules. I mean, everyone needs to, to absorb that, that one, one out of three surgical lung biopsies in this country happen for something that's not remotely cancer. So besides the level of invasiveness on that, which is obviously unacceptable, um, and the associated risk of complications, which is the next slot over, um, just imagine too, depending on how much lung is removed, now flash forward five years and your patient actually has a malignant nodule, but because they had borderline lung function to begin with, we went and operated. Now we don't have um, the same level of lung function to safely undergo the curative resection that your patient now needs, you know, five years later or whatever. Yeah, you know, I always found that statistic stunning. I mean, up to a third of the patients, um, they're undergoing uh, lung surgical biopsies. I mean, these are patients that are essentially, like you're saying, go through the journey of a lung cancer patient, but they don't even have lung cancer. And so right. th there's really a wide open opportunity to be able to change the way we do things. And obviously we can do better. Correct. And that's obviously where the idea of a non-invasive diagnostic test to stratify these lung nodules does help us. Because look, if we miss you know, this is this to me has always been the value, the value prospect of the Percepta test, because if you had a pretest probability, let's you know, let's just say a patient has a 30% chance it's cancer. You know, there's I can't imagine there's too many patients that want to sit on that. That's that's a you know clearly still a 70% chance it's not, but that that would that would freak me out. You'd be biopsying me for sure if that was what you know if this was me. Yeah. But but here's the thing. So then you and I miss. So then now what? Like, how do you in good faith tell the patient to watch and wait? You were worried enough to take them in for a bronch. You know, how do you now say, nah, it's okay to sit on this? You, I mean, you really honestly can't. And again, I mean, patient, you know, choice. If the patient says, no way, I'm not having X, Y, or Z. I get it. But again, we're talking, you know, guidance here. But that's the value prospect, to take that non-diagnostic bronch, give some actual data that can say to the patient, you're a much lower risk than I thought we can watch this or wow, you're, you're worse than I thought. Like, and since I staged your mediastinum, let's go get this thing cut out. So that's, that's the value. Cause right here, this, right. I mean, Chris, this is this, this graph, this diagram from the guidelines and, and others really does highlight kind of every day. What, you know, if you do lung nodules and bronchoscopy at all, you face, you got oh, yeah. the nodule, you got the nodule. Do you go for some kind of more invasive biopsy? Do you do a bronch or do you watch and wait? And the problem is, is that, Right there in the middle, uh, the you know yellowy orange color, we miss. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, you and I think right. So one of the stats on that last, uh, I'll pull it back here. Up to sixty percent can be inconclusive, and I hate to say it, but this is the reality for a lot of us. And and so, um, and if you're one of those bronchoscopists that hits ninety nine percent of them, congratulations, you're better than me. I can I can tell you that. But the reality is, um, there's a yeah, lot. Yeah, no, of I mean, look. 
go out and struggle to get a biopsy because it's really the only great option for a, bron for a patient. Bronchoscopy is one of the most humane forms of lung biopsy with low risks associated with it in terms of morbidity and mortality. Um, but, you know, we, we don't all, always hit it. And so we, this is, again, another, you know, great slide demonstrating what are you going to do? What are you going to offer that patient? And this is a wide open opportunity for us to offer something for these patients. Exactly. I think the next Let's one's go to your another case. Let's go to another case, right? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. 66 year old smoker, uh, 1.7 centimeter sub solid lesion in the right upper lobe that everyone can see one image. Uh, pet SUV of 2.5, right there in the sort of scary, not so scary category. It's perfect, right? You know, it's not an SUV of nine, nor is it an SUV of one. So what's the nodule risk of malignancy here? Uh, let's go to the polls, see what our group thinks. All right, well, everybody hit, thinking. Hit the, hit the next slide, hit the next slide quick so they can see their choices. There, yes. there it is. Choices are gonna be high, which is defined as greater than 60%, intermediate, which is where the bulk of the lung nodules are that uh, Dr. Hogarth had mentioned, and low, low risk of malignancy. You know, I'm going to take a step back and just take a look at this real quickly and then just kind of walk through what I I'm thinking while the polls are coming in and I can see what people are thinking here. Um, and so uh, so you got a 66-year-old, you got a smoker. Obviously, those things uh, raise concerns. But here's where I, I started to get really worried is that size. We talked about the 9-millimeter lung notch before. It's 1.7 centimeters. That's larger on my side. That means that you got to start thinking about what you want to do. That's probably... Um, on every guideline that you can imagine, AC, uh, NCCN, ACCP, Fleischner guidelines, hey, this is a concerning lung nodule. The subsolid component makes me even more worried that this might be an adenocarcinoma in situ or a BAC um, that's converting over into a more invasive adenocarcinoma. The other things I worry about, it's in the upper lobe, um, and it's not hot, but I wouldn't expect a a subsolid lung nodule to necessarily be very, very uh, bright on PET or FDG AVID. Um, so what, what I'm going to say is, and I'm cheating a little bit because I can actually see the, the audience poll, um, is that I think that this is going to be high. Um, oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah. And I think that's where it's always interesting. You know, um, I think, you know, there's, there's, the, the, it's funny, you know, the intermediate category has a broad range. I, I, I can't imagine, again, patient preference aside, that any of us are in good faith going to suggest watch and wait on this. So let's see what the let's go to the next slide and kind of see what we think to do next. Um, so as everyone sees their choices here, um, let's go back and look at that image again. And, and though it's relatively peripheral, there's a you know on the one slice. If you could, could back it up one second, Christian, let's see the 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 um, image. Yep. Good amount of emphysema around that lesion. I mean, this is definitely a high risk uh, pneumo and uh, potential bronchopleural fistula with a transthoracic needle aspirate. So looking at this, let me see what would I think, and everybody go ahead and vote. Um, so bronchoscopy with EBIS. I'm, I don't, you know, I don't know what the lung function for this patient is, but if let's say if I didn't know or needed to, or, you know, given its peripheral nature, I think bronchoscopy with EVIS navigation is not unnecessarily a bad thing. I think it might be a good option for somebody, especially if they have significant issues with their lung function and wedge resection or surgical intervention may be a little bit problematic. CT surveillance, three months. Yeah, I don't feel comfortable with that at all. Um, and I think a lot of you are saying the same thing when I look at the dashboard here. Um, and then in terms of transthoracic needle aspirate, you know, this is where institution dependent how good you are with the Bronx, what kind of tools you have, the technology that's surrounding you, the support level that you have. You know, this is not unreasonable. And in my institution, you know, there, you know, I don't, I don't think that they would be excited, mainly because if you look back at that an image, there's some emphysema uh, peripherally uh, in, re in relation. There may be a risk of, you know, bronchopleural fistula and thoracic surgery. You know, there's an argument there. So when I look at this, I think. Of the four choices given, uh, and the audience seems to agree, bronchoscopy with EBIS, transthoracic needle aspirate, and thoracic surgery, it's really a kind of like dealer's choice. But I think, you know, you know, I hate to say this, Kyle, I'm so biased in, in you know, in, in terms of bronchoscopy. I still think it's one of the most humane uh, options available. I would hate to subject this patient to thoracic surgical intervention only to find out, um, you know, that 
you know, no. something yeah. else. Yeah. So. No, no, I agree. I, I mean, look, I, I come with my biases too. That I mean, you know, bronchoscopy is the greatest thing ever, right? <laughs> no, but um, I, I guess what I still say is bronchoscopy is the complete procedure because um, you can diagnose, but you can also stage. And now even when we miss, we can still stage and then get still valuable information by adding in the perceptive test. I mean, I think that's what takes the value prospect of bronch up a whole nother notch because the TTNA, even if you prove that's an adenocarcinoma, now what? You haven't staged the patient and I'd be pretty reluctant to want to go resect this without knowing the status of the mediastinum, especially with some of the data that's been coming out of the University of Vermont um, that they presented at the AABIP meeting on the higher you know, the, the, the smaller peripheral nodule that still has N2 disease, for example. Oh, yeah. And I think we're, we're realizing that the, we need to know what's going on in the media sign. And one of the biggest problems we have is, you know, staging. And that's a separate topic. But, yeah, no, I think that bronchoscopy with ubis is reasonable. Um, so how did it go with this case? Um, so, um, this one wasn't mine, so I can't claim the, uh, the miss on this one, <laughs> but, um, uh, you, radial EBIS and radial EBIS a probe was used and, 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 you know, I, I, again, I don't know when this case was done and, and we all have access to different levels of technology and our own skill sets in the periphery, but, um, in the end it was ultimately missed. Um, but, um, the perceptive GSC test was done. So let's go on. Okay. So here, so let's play this video. Yeah. I'll play this video and then I'll let you take over and kind of talk about that. But this is an important concept, and I want. And if you're going to pay attention to any slide in this talk, and I wake up, this is a good one to pay attention to. So we'll walk through the video, and then Dr. Hogarth will talk about the field of injury, uh, okay. which is really the theory behind this. In current or former smokers with lung cancer, gene expression changes exist throughout the airway. The Percepta test detects these genomic changes to determine the likelihood that a nodule is cancerous without the need to sample the nodule directly. The test relies on cells taken from the easy-to-reach main airway, which are collected at the start of a bronchoscopy. When bronchoscopy results are inconclusive, Verisite runs the Percepta classifier in its CLIA certified lab. The test uses RNA sequencing to stratify the risk of primary lung cancer for intermediate pretest risk patients to either low risk so they can potentially avoid unnecessary invasive biopsies or to high risk to inform next intervention steps. Right. I mean, I think there's a couple of key things that come out of that video. It also obviously tells you how to do the procedure. Um, one of the questions that popped up on the polls was, whether or not you could get a pneumothorax from Percepta because you do the brushes. But as you even see from the little animation, you're doing a brush from the main stem. And this is you do at the beginning of the bronch. It's, it adds 30 seconds, maybe a minute at the most, to the bronchoscopy. Um, and you, you stash it off to the side. And we'll, we'll go through that again later. But um, if you make a diagnosis during the case, then you can throw it away. But if you don't, you've got it ready to go. Um, so you're collecting uh, epithelial cells and it's done as part of this normal bronchoscopy because there are changes in gene expression throughout the airway and that's that entire field of injury so you always do the right main stem it doesn't matter where the nodule is located so you're not this has nothing to do with your navigation and let's let's actually expand this let's assume that someone who's listening is a bronchoscopist who, who doesn't have any of the advanced technologies to get to the periphery but is going to do the bronchoscopy because there's a, a realistic chance that this nodule could represent a, you know, a fungal infection or a mycobacterial infection based on their, you know, patient population, et cetera, et cetera. And so they're going to take the patient for bronch, just for bronch alveolar lavage. So short bronchoscopy, go in, target, you know, the wedge into the target lobe, lavage, send it for culture and cytology and get out. Real quick bronch. There's absolutely no reason you shouldn't add this to that bronchoscopy because we all know that the chance that the culture is going to pick up something is low, but man, we would actually get some very valuable data from this field of injury on a patient just like that. Um, and so adding next to no time, no risk to the procedure, or no additional risk to the procedure, and yet actually getting some real valuable information from the bronc. And to be honest, way more valuable than any time the BAL has been the sole answer of the lung nodule. So let's go on to the next slide. Well, one more. There we go. So the let's go through the you know the background for this for this classifier. Um, so the original perceptive bronchial genomic classifier. Um, uh, you're familiar with the papers. They were uh, published in the New England Journal, the ages one and two. Uh, this was microarray technology with 23 genes. Um, then uh, as as it was approved and, and being launched, 
the uh, Perceptor Registry uh, uh, happened and we were part of. Um, this was real world clinical utility to show how the test actually impacted patient management. We'll, we'll come back to that at the end uh, using my own personal experience of data from, from the University of Chicago. Um, but showing that, you know, this test, it wasn't just, you know, oh, look at it in the middle of a data set, but look at it in, in the real world. Um, but that Perceptor Registry also provided patient samples for the development and the validation of the next generation classifier. So to take Perceptor to the next level, and that's where the Perceptor GSC comes in. So this genomic sequence classifier was a redeveloped and clinically validated with a combined cohort from ages one and two and the Perceptor Registry and uses whole transcriptome RNA sequencing technology to help develop a signal for stratifying the risk as to high or to low. So let's let's go through that data. So I'm yeah, go, go ahead and go through the build. Yeah. yeah, go through the build. There you go. So let's have that intermediate bronch and or intermediate nodule. And we have an inconclusive bronch. So what did we get data-wise? So we had some lows, and there's some 99% negative predictive value got classified to very low. So in the scenario where a low prevalent nodule was being uh, bronched, uh, the negative predictive value to come back and say it's very low, so even less worried, is profound. Um, I think equally important in that group, and most important in that group, um, is the intermediate. We'll come back to that in two seconds. Let's look at the high. So if you were doing a bronch on someone who was high risk, um, and, and I can think of a scenario where this might be valid. Um, a very, very poor operative candidate um, and someone who uh, the nodule is difficult to obtain. Um, some people do work with radiation oncologists that are willing to radiate um, biopsy inconclusive nodules that are deemed high risk. When you can take with a 91% positive predictive value to put someone into the very high category, a greater than 80% chance that the nodule you missed on is malignant, um, you know, you had a pre-test probability, let's say, of 62 and some nodule calculator. Um, you know, I think each radiation oncologist is different, but there is a scenario where this could be quite valuable. But that intermediate, that's the sweet spot for all of us, because that's the area that we're doing a lot of bronc on. Um, and when we look to have some test that comes back with a 91% negative predictive value that you might have thought it was intermediate risk, but it's actually low risk, to then confidently say to the patient, the risk's not as high as I thought, I think we should get a follow-up scan, you know, instead of a more invasive procedure. Um, you can say it with confidence. And I think equally important, what was new in the GSC was the ability to come back and have with a 65% positive predictive value, hey, you might have been a 30% nodule. It's actually worse than we thought. Um, I'm even more worried about you. And so I'm going to send you to the surgeon because, you know, I staged a mediastinum. And I think there's the value, the ability to take that inconclusive bronch and help guide your patient towards a slower process or a more invasive process, but to do it with a good statistical confidence that using uh, the patient's genomic data and that field of injury to make decisions. This is really so, interesting. Yeah. No, and I think what's good is when you look at the GSC, um, when we look at that, the power of, of the, uh, the, the statistics behind it, on, it was, granted on a small sample set, but it didn't matter what size nodule, it did not matter whether it was central or peripheral, it did not matter if it was an adenoid or squame, et cetera. Um, it's, you know, nodule period, just nodule. And in the end, no matter what it ended up being, that didn't matter. So let's go, this was the result um, ultimately for my, that first case. Um, they were classified as intermediate, they came back as low risk. And you could confidently say to the patient, we should watch and wait. Um, that negative predictive value of 91%, notice it's not 100%. So that does not mean you don't need follow-up, but it does mean, of course, that you can comfortably say we should watch and wait as a guidance. So here's that case. We missed. Evis was normal. Hit it again. This one is your case. So you got this. This is my case. This is my real live patient. Okay. Um, the guy that I said, I'm going to bronch you and I'm going to likely miss and we're going to do Percepta so that I can get some data and see if I can instead downgrade your risk and confidently tell you to watch and wait. But I'll have sampled your nodes while I'm in there. Um, and so, you know, in case we have to go in surgically, uh, at least, you know, we're going in with confidence. Well, he came back low risk. So I said to him, my advice, man, is we should do nothing. And so he said, 
okay, you know, let's do follow up scan, follow up scan. So we got a three month scan, didn't change. We did a scan uh, at the one year mark, didn't change. Did a scan at the two year mark, didn't change. So obviously he declared this thing as, uh, you know, a non issue. Um, no more active follow up of that nodule. Where of course, and, and, and he did at least quit smoking. Um, the, uh, the nice thing of that, this is a perfect example. This is a guy who the reason we did his bronc was to essentially get him ready for a surgical resection of that nodule and a potential lobectomy uh, given it's the location or at least a significant amount of lung removed. And it would have been for a benign lesion. So this simple little test saved this guy, one individual from a serious invasive procedure. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's, in, it's about as real world as it gets. Now, we also have the scenario now with the GSC to take that intermediate risk and bump it up. So let's go, you know, that, that second case, we came back as calculated in the mid thirties, right? Now, you know, they missed, now what? Well, if you stage the mediastinum and it's negative and your GSC comes back now at high risk, you can confidently say to this patient, again, assuming surgical candidacy, yada, 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 hey, this, uh, we might have missed, and, but your mediastinum is negative and the probability of cancer, though not you know perfect, is higher than I thought and with enough confidence that, yeah, there's still a chance we're gonna be resecting something benign, but it's worth that risk. And let's go on to the next slide and you'll see the results from that patient. So remember they missed and it actually was up classified. So they went with confidence to surgical resection. And of course it was an adenocarcinoma, but as you know, we had known from the EBUS, the mediastinum was negative. So this patient was confidently resected and, and ultimately cured. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the value here is, you know, they were intermediate risk. You know, this one might've been one where, you know, and I, and I, I talked um, uh, to the physician who, who did this case, this was a patient who was very reluctant to pursue surgery unless they absolutely had to. And, and we all have those patients. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think this is one, you know, that, that individually I might have just said, look, you know, I missed, you know, even if I didn't have perceptance, said, but the risk is still, you know, fairly high at 30%. When it comes back and I say, no, you're high risk, man, you know, I, I, this is the kind of thing I show the patient, you know, this, this diagram and, and, Say so this is why, in my medical opinion, you should be getting this resected. And I always explain there's still a chance I'm wrong and it's going to be benign, but the chance of that has been dropping now. So let's confidently go get this resected. Um, and you know, and in this particular case, obviously, um, this patient, the the perceptive test helped propel them to say, "Gosh, the risk is you know getting definitely worse than a coin flip." <laughs> so. Let me ask you if this patient wasn't a surgical resection, would you have done SBRT? Just curious, because if you showed me this, and let's say I was a non-surgical candidate, and the Percepta test told me that I was high risk, and I was a patient, if you told me at a, let's just say 60% or 65%, like a six out of 10 patients would be positive for cancer, um, would you consider that? I mean, I think it, would, it might even help me in that scenario as well. So you say the non-surgical patient. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's I mean, always that's that's always one of those tumor board questions, right? I mean, clearly you and I, I mean, none of us make these decisions in a vacuum. And I think I think this is this is data to help in a discussion. I mean, I think um, you know, I, I you know, maybe that's a, a scenario of a very short follow-up, you know, film, you know, a month later kind of thing, just to see if it shrunk at all, like if it was something infectious, you know, you live in the histoblasto belt like I do, and you know, so um you know, I mean, there's lots of different nuances. I think that's where lung nodule guidelines always have this flexibility because there's a lot of things that factor into these discussions. But um, yeah, I think that's not unreasonable, Christian, in the right scenario. So, you know, where do we view this test? Let's go back to those bronx that are inconclusive. Um, and here it is, it's right there to help guide you and I to fix the worst complication of bronchoscopy, the miss the inconclusive bronc, and to help get some data from that to help guide your patient in their shared decision-making of what is best for the next step. That's its role. That's great. In practice, so real yeah. easy. So 
Go ahead. Question, Go ahead. Yeah, one question is coming from the audience is that you made mention that you do it in the beginning. Can you clarify? I think you and I have probably do the same thing and it's kind of what, what I recommend, but can you elaborate? When do you do the test? Do you do it at the beginning or at the end of the end of, let's say, you're at the end of the bronchoscopy and all you're hearing from your cytopath is, I mean, this happened to me today, benign bronx, blood, epithelial cells. Right. Um, you know, we're not the, sure. The, the holy triad. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no. So the reason we do it at the beginning is is kind of for multiple reasons. Um, uh, one, you know, the, you're, you've gone in, you're, you're, you're just doing a quick inspection, bronx, sucking out mucus, you know, yada, yada get it done, get it over with, because um, the airways aren't yet, you know, especially if you've had complications from the bronc, like if, the, you know, envision a scenario, if there was a, a significant amount of bleeding, you know, hopefully not, but, you know, prepare for anything. Um, part of it is to get it out of the way because if a bronc, you know, it, a peripheral bronchoscopy, no matter what platform you're using, when it's going right, the whole, everything just feels good, right? It's a quick case, you zoom in, you get your biopsies, you get your diagnosis, you feel great about yourself, you're moving on, yay, right? When you are struggling, it just gets ugly really quick in most bronc suites that I've ever been in. And, you know, that's where the tension starts to rise and people are trying other tricks and they're still not getting a diagnosis and the anger factor is going up a whole nother notch. And so, um, and then you're switching over to Evis and you're angry the whole time. And, you know, you know the note, the media time is likely going to be negative. So you're just angry that you're having to do it. And you honestly, at least I know I have, completely forgot to do the Percepta. And so the reason right away at the beginning we moved ourselves to doing it right up front was to avoid the Kyle anger factor of whipping the scope out and cursing while saying scope out and you know it's so, going to that that procedural right. hole right I know <laughs> right no I know you've been there too anybody anyone who says they're not furious after a non-diagnostic bronc is lying yeah. so you know that that was the practicality of it you know we we look you know it's a it's a test that's not going to cost you, the individual institution, a thing because the brushes come as part of the kit. So do we do the brushes, clip them off. If we end up throwing them away, who cares, right? It's not my money. And the brushes it's not, come with it's the not kit. your patient's money. You know, it comes with the kit. Right. And you're not, yeah. You're, it's it's not, yeah. Money. yeah, it's very sad money. Um, so essentially, uh, so you collect it in the beginning. If it turns out that you need it, you send it. If it turns out that you don't need it, you toss it. Correct. That's, right. that's it. Exactly. That's pretty so, easy. That's, it's super easy. Hit hit the next slide because we'll see. It will take it to another level. You know. So we we we. You know, who do we send it on? I mean, I guess we should you know clarify. We you know we don't start this at the beginning of quote every bronc because we clearly have broncs that come to us that are stage fours, right? So we're talking still about solitary or uh, semi-solid pulmonary nodules that you know in the intermediate category here, um, or high or low because the test has value there, but nodules not the obvious stage four disease and you're just going to get some lymph nodes and get out um the key is they have to be a current or former smoker and the smoking is 100 total cigarettes like literally five whole packs in a lifetime so pretty much that is a good chunk of the country and they can't have a current or prior solid malignancy or like a leukemia other than um, simples like squamous and basal cells of the skin, those are fine. The prior cancer history, those were excluded from analysis. Um, so, you know, if you're if you have a lung cancer patient resected, cured, and on surveillance, X years later has a new nodule, uh, there's no validation of of this test in that clinical scenario. You know, and you that makes it yeah, makes go sense. Ahead. Yeah, if you're talking about a patient who has lung cancer, they come up with another nodule. This isn't your intermediate patient. This is your intermediate risk patient. A patient who has pre-existing history of lung cancer comes back with another lung nodule. They're they're at high risk. You know that. Exactly. So, I mean, That's cancer till proven otherwise. One thing that I thought was really interesting is I asked uh, Verisite and I was like, how do you define where did this hundred cigarettes come from? And, Apparently, it comes from – that's the definition from the CDC for a smoker, and that's the that's a large number of patients, and it's not I – mean, and it's just really – so this is widely applicable, and I think that's right. – and, that, and then here's the key is step two. So step one is collecting it. Right there at the beginning, two brushes done. Then, you you, you know, non-diagnostic bronch, and, and you ship it in. Now, you know, I've, you've had the same experience I have too, Chris. Sometimes Rose is non-diagnostic. And uh, four days later, final path comes back diagnostic. 
So you don't you don't need it anymore. You made a cancer diagnosis or a definitive, you know, benign diagnosis, whatever. Um, but frequently, of course, the, the final comes back still negative or non-diagnostic. That's then where you order the test and you get that through the portal or through the app. I will say the app is ridiculously simple. Um, you click on it saying, you know, yeah, run it or don't run it because I made a diagnosis, you know, throw it away. And then you get the results in roughly two weeks and then you and you get that simple, you know, what to do to help guide your management of your patients. Um, you get everything you need with the brushes and the collection kit and the mailing kit. And Verisite bills Medicare and the third parties directly. So this is not billed through your medical center. So your medical center is not in the collections business on this test. Um, and then there's obviously financial support for uninsured and commercially insured who have the financial need if the test isn't covered by them. It's covered by Medicare. So the registry was real world. Let's get super real world. Let's get down to the experience at the University of Chicago. Um, 26 patients were enrolled ultimately in the registry. We had 20 with intermediate pretest risk. Um, did it help? And, and you know, I guess the first question too is, um, you know, did you actually ever get intermediate risks that got, you know, down classified? You know, if I if I did 20 intermediate risks and only one got down classified, you know, that's not exactly helping, right? And yet eight of them got down classified. So roughly 40% of the non-diagnostic bronchs that we had had a, uh, the ability to be down classified. Well, okay. That's good. I mean, that's great. That means we're actually getting data from the test that we could use something with. But did it actually change management? So the way the Precipta registry was set up is prior to the bronc, we outlined what our plan was going to be if we missed. So we had to have this discussion with the patient saying, what if, what if? And the question was, if you came back low risk, what would we do? And I think that's where it gets really interesting because the plan had always been for all these patients, if we missed, we were going to do some other level of a diagnostic procedure, whether that was TTNA, you know, whether that was surgery. And and you notice here, it says 87%, so seven out of the eight, didn't go on for the planned invasive procedure with the non-diagnostic bronc because we were able to confidently say, look, you came back low risk, let's watch and wait. That right there, that's real world, that's avoidance of unnecessary procedures. And that obviously is huge. And this is huge too. I mean, if you think about it, looking at your data, what you've gone through, um, for those uh, seven patients, you know, that got, were able to avoid an invasive procedure, that's amazing, first off. Right. And the second thing is that- And I will say the one, the one had been very strongly advised not to have an invasive procedure, but patient- uh, uh, sought out a thoracic surgeon who, you know, very much was uh, said, sure, I'll cut that thing out, which of course was a granuloma. And uh, so the patient uh, was cured of the scar they had, um, <laughs> cured, quote, quote. And then of course, came back to clinic complaining of uh, pain at her VATS incision sites and so forth. And I just said, look, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but this is why I told you to do nothing. Right, exactly. And then the other thing is, is that you know, to the bronchoscopist. Think about the value in this. You've salvaged the bronch. You've made totally. it a worthwhile test. I mean, this totally. is amazing. Yeah. And so you took that where you're in that dark hole and you switched it around and you basically did a lot of a, a lot of good for this patient. So this is really powerful data. Absolutely. Any questions? So there was a, earlier, you know, again, I, I want to reiterate, there was a question about like pneumothorax risk. I mean, there's none. This is not a brushing that you're collecting when you're navigating. So, you know, wh whatever method of peripheral bronchoscopy you're doing, that's the same generic risk that, you know, based on the fact you're doing peripheral bronchoscopy. This is a main stem brushing. Uh, we do it right at the beginning. Um, there'd been a question about the billing. It's covered through Medicare. Um, could amount with through third party, but otherwise... Uh, through the company, there's there's support to essentially to uh, help with that component of the billing. Um, you know, I, the, the registry data showing the ability to avoid procedures is how this got Medicare coverage. It was that solid data that said, look, you're gonna we're gonna definitively help patients avoid an unnecessary invasive procedure, and it was a a key component of it. That's um, impressive. There was a question about doing this. I think I'd mentioned this earlier, but there was a question about doing it just during a you know, so-called BAL bronchoscopy uh, for a nodule evaluation. 
Yeah, the, you, this test doesn't require that you've done a peripheral bronchoscopy. Um, you know, it, it's generally been thought of in that setting where a peripheral bronch was done and was missed. Um, but on for those that don't do peripheral bronchoscopy, but are lavaging a uh, airway uh, or lavaging a lobe for a nodule that's present, um, uh, and that you're sending for cytology and for infectious workup, um, as as you know, if you're honest with yourself, you know how often that the, that bronch comes back non-diagnostic, which is quite often. Adding the perceptive test to that kind of a bronch actually will give extreme value to the bronchoscopy because for once we'll be able to up or down classify uh, that patient's nodule and guide you, uh, the pulmonologist, towards telling this patient to do a watch and wait follow-up or to very much go on to a more invasive procedure or refer to an interventional peripheral bronchoscopist. Let me ask you, there's one question here. What do you do with the patient that was intermediate pretest and then uh, intermediate post perceptive yeah, um, that's the. I, I guess you know that takes us back uh, when that happens, um, and as you saw from our data, it was roughly sixty percent of the time, right? Um, that's an ongoing discussion with the patient, and and you know the patient decision making and tumor board as well. Um, I will still always posit that the advantage to uh, the bronchoscopy, even when we miss, uh, and if the perceptor didn't change the risk stratification, was to at least stage the mediastinum, um, and so. Um, uh, the, the usual hub around the, you know, the sort of patient shared decision making is the patient's threshold to avoid surgery or wanting definitiveness and wanting the surgery. So, you know, some went for TTNA um, and some went for um, um, direct surgical management, um, you know, because in the end, the, the risk didn't get modified. I think the other key thing here, um, when we look at national data on how long it takes for an abnormal Bronch, um, I'm sorry, abnormal scan to then ultimately undergo a biopsy to then undergo, you know, curative resection, et cetera. This, this concern of, it's a 91% negative predictive value. So that does obviously mean that if you told a patient to get a follow-up scan, um, there is a chance that three months later, that follow-up scan, that nodule will, will get slightly larger, right? And then now, you know, the, and you go and get it resected and it turns out to be malignant. Um, so what about that scenario? So there's a couple of interesting things that also came out of the registry, which was that the time to curative resection for the ones that were down classified, but in reality were still malignant to getting resected was honestly no different than those that were intermediate risk to begin with. And, and why might that be? So let's think about this. So a patient, you know, when you look at national data, a patient gets a scan for whatever reason, may not actually talk to their doctor for seven to 10 more days to be told you have a nodule. Then they get told, go see you know, this pulmonologist or that surgeon or whatever. Well, that can be a two to three to four week affair, depending on uh, you know, your own institution and yourself. Um, then you schedule them for that bronc. Um, and then next thing you know, from the time of the original scan, six to seven weeks has already passed. And so, um, when you say to a patient, let's get a follow-up scan um, at the three-month mark, it's not three months from your bronch, it's only a few more weeks after your bronch because then you're already at the three-month mark from the original CT scan. And so when the perceptor says, let's watch and wait, you're not waiting for that long on the average patient, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think for, you know, for us to... I mean, in the ideal world, we would love for us to see a patient do the bronch the next day and then figure out what the results are, you know, within a week. But the reality is, is that that's almost never happening. Uh, I think the average, you know, for a patient from the time of discovery of a lung lesion to diagnosis and to potential treatment is in the neighborhood of eight months. And so, um, so if if we're truncating that, if we're involved and we get active in it with a bronchoscopy, and you know we're going to continue, you're going to default to standard of care. You're going to watch this, and I think that's one of the things that's really important that you're pointing out is that um, even if you have a ne uh, you know this strong negative predictive value, you're going to still continue to follow the patient, and um, but you're also you know at the same time sparing a lot of patients unnecessary procedures with confidence. Yep. Yep, absolutely. I think we I covered. Yeah, yeah I, think so I don't see any other questions. Yeah. Anybody else there want to have any of those they want to raise? Or Chris, any other things you wanted to add? 
No, I don't, I don't think I have a, a much more to add. Thank you so much for the insight, the data that you presented from University of Chicago. Um, maybe you can give a, a little bit of insight into, uh, for those people who are still interested in the SAB and participating, and speak a little bit to the audience about that as we close out. And, uh, and thank you to the audience for coming and uh, taking time out of your busy schedules. And if you're listening to this after the fact and recording this, thanks for uh, listening to Kyle and I. We appreciate your time. And I'll hand it off uh, over to uh, Kyle Hogarth to close it out for us. Yeah, so um, you know, the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy was formed uh, to be a society to have a single purpose, which is to further the growth of bronchoscopy and grow the field um, and improve quality. Um, and the realization that a lot of amazing bronchoscopy is going on all over this country and all over this world, um, and not just at universities like my own that I'm lucky enough to work at, but that there's um, should be room for everybody at the table. Um, so for those that are listening, um, this is a society that is uh, not top down and we would very much like your involvement. Um, come uh, join uh, committees. Uh, you've got a great idea. We want to hear it and uh, pretty much guarantee the answer is going to be yes. <laughs> um, let's run with it. So um, get involved. Uh, for fellows, it's free. Um, and uh, come to our meetings. Uh, our meetings are held, as you know, during uh, CHESS and ATS. Uh, they're fantastic. Um, always a good time as well. Very uh, social, good networking opportunities. Um, so the society, uh, its strength comes from its members. Uh, so please join, get your friends to join, and more importantly, get involved. Thanks, Chris. Hey, thanks a lot. And, and thank you also to our friends uh, at Verisite for uh, their support of the SAB, uh, but also for sponsoring this webinar tonight. Thank you again. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye.